everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and yes, game masters. With the questers Josh and Dan, I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things thanatological and galemical part three, I think? Three. Three, yes. Three. Uh, Because we're going to talk about more horror constructs to just give you some nightmares and throw against your players when you've had enough of them. It is that time of year. It is appropriate that we are doing our series on horror constructs and stuff here as we continue into spooky season. Although this is a series that will continue beyond because really (laughs) Halloween should be all year round. Exactly. We can go live in Halloween town for 365. Anyway, just continuing the alphabetical nature that we started off with uh, in the previous two episodes. This is a lovely little batch a perfect 10, if you will, of uh, some creepy, crawly, nasty things to throw at your players. Uh, we will start with the Morn Guard. This is an eight-foot-tall suit of black plate armor dripping with blood, covered in blades that are stained with blood. Uh, the, void, the head is void, basically with a pair of purple eyes glowing, uh, staring out at you from the armor itself. These are fearless. They are ruthless. They are undead. This is... The adepts, an adept soul bound to the armor by the horror itself, and it was stripped yeah. from its body. So this is, yeah, good going, Morgan. <laughs> the Morn Guard is, in a way, and I, again, with all of these parallels that I've been drawing for these more powerful horror constructs and such, I don't know whether these are intended on Morgan's part, but the Morn Guard strikes me as the Earth Dawn version of the Death Knight from D and D. Yeah. The Death Knight being a most typically a an undead fallen paladin or powerful warrior of some sort. Lord Soth from Dragon Lance is a Death Knight. <laughs> so yeah, the Morn Guard strikes me as that sort of opponent, that it is a very powerful, very dangerous physical combatant that is the result of in this case, not, yes, a fallen foe of a horror, but not one that failed their oaths and was in that way. They were just defeated and then turned in to servants of the horror and yeah. one that is pretty nasty. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the, the power that sticks out to me from the Guard is the Feast of Suffering. Yeah. That's a nice one. That gives the Morngard bonuses on attack and damage for each wound that their target has. They are also insubstantial, which means oh. that attacks with physical items, even though they are a big suit of armor, yeah, attacks with physical items require an additional success in order to hit, unless it's an area effect. So they can mm-hmm. still sort of be affected normally by spells without needing that. But if you're trying to hit them with a sword or shoot them with a bow or anything like that, you need to roll better than you otherwise would. (laughs) Essentially, they're harder to hit and they take a little bit less damage than they otherwise would because you don't get that extra success to to boost your damage result. Fair. Uh, Do these... They also have pretty high resist pain. (laughs) They've got resistances to fear. They've got tactics as an ability, which means that if they are the commander of a group of lesser minions, then they can boost those minions as a result of using the uh, the tactics. Mm-hmm. Well, and they can't be knocked unconscious. So, yeah, they don't. I mean, as is the case <laughs> with a lot of undead, they don't have an unconscious rating. They've got a reasonably high death rating. They've got pretty decent defenses and all that sort of stuff, you know. As as you expect from a high journeyman tier, actually, Ninth Circle, they are low warden tier yeah. opponent. But the thing is that they are not intended to be necessarily a big, strong, like single opponent that you go up against because they have tactics and things like that. They also have a special maneuver opening, which allows them to provide bonuses to allies attack tests, if they spend extra successes on their attack, they can provide those bonuses to allies attack. They are supposed to be a sort of commander unit 
of other horror minions. So you put them in with a group of brutes, which we talked about last time. Yep. Or anything like that that's a sort of lower powered but tough physical opponent that you would see in some kind of numbers, a group of cadaver men, a group of ghouls, you know, totally. anything like that. The Morn Guard then can act as a commander and with their step 16 tactics can turn those what might be not a huge problem for a higher circle group, but give those lesser units bonuses that could end up making them be a little bit more of a threat than you might otherwise expect. Agreed. So yeah, if that's not enough for you, we have more because mm, yeah, Morngard, fun stuff for the game master. Anyway, on to the night twist. Now I say that as fast as I can, because there's only one T in the middle of this word night twist. Yes. So it's not night twist. It's night twist. Anyway, it is also a ninth circle opponent. This is uh, created by the horror Restool. So these are twisted strands of darkness bending and distorting the night air around them uh, of varying sizes. Anything from basically uh, a windling to a large dog. Um, but they only appear in corrupted areas, only appear near astral breaches, or only uh, appear near horror marked characters. So these are kind of specific in placement. However, still very nasty. Yeah. So the night twist is one of the creatures, one of the constructs here in the companion that did actually appear in first edition. The night twist first appeared, I believe, in the original horrors source book um, because Correct. of its connection with Ristool. We'll talk about Ristool in more depth later on when we get to the actual entry about that particular horror but many episodes later the night twist is sort of a manifestation of sorts of ristool's corruption it's kind of difficult to fight because it is kind of shadowy and whatnot tangible and and, yeah. and intangible although it does not have the insubstantial trait at all but it can fly. It's got terror as a power. It can actually target opponents uh, astrally. It targets mystic defense with its unarmed attacks instead of physical defense. Similar to like the spirit strike talent allows adepts to do. Um, it just does it automatically. It's got the corrupt karma power, which is always mm -hmm. fun. <laughs> but it's really nasty ability and what really sets it apart is its ability to infect someone's pattern and it mm. basically gets inside them and takes control in a sense yeah at that point it can be difficult to detect and so once it's inside it can use any of its powers against the host as it wishes, but it can't be harmed physically. And the only way you can harm it is with mystic attacks that also harm the host. Mm -hmm. They are really, really nasty things to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> you got a really good problem resolution skills on this one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is possible once you've identified that someone has been infected by a night twist to remove it, but it generally requires a, a reasonably high amount of horror lore mm. and pattern craft and various other things in order to untangle the night twist and its taint from the pattern of its victim. And we all know how bad removing taint is just. They're kind of nasty. This is one of those that you could use in a scenario where you've got individuals that are being infected. We talked about the pestilent ghoul being a kind of classic zombie monster zombie apocalypse mm -hmm. yeah. spreading the the disease kind of thing the night twist is more of a not quite like invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing but um definitely a sort of in an area that is dangerous because what can happen is that you could have somebody that goes into a, a corrupted area and gets infected by a night twist and might not realize it and carries it out to an area where it can then end up doing more harm yeah you know, again, the, the Night Twist doesn't really control the victim at all. 
but it is very, very difficult to deal with once it has infected somebody. And there are a whole lot of things that it can do to cause problems. There's a whole sidebar about the various things that might come about as a result of this infection. Yeah. So that's not enough for you. On to the night worm. Slightly lower level. It's a third circle encounter, more or less. This creature resembles a giant silkworm. And this is where I was misreading my notes. This is about the size of a small dog or a large bovine calf. So pretty big honking worm, gotta say. This is slightly more bulbous, so not exact, not as streamlined or as uh, tapered. This has translucent skin, which if that's not creepy enough, a translucent skin worm. Ugh, sorry, a little body shiver there. Yeah, they're just otherwise fun because these have some really nasty things to do. Not so much of a physical opponent. I think these are more of a mental opponent. Yeah. <laughs> these guys are sort of translucent, goopy, scary looking giant worm caterpillar monstrosities. Oh, yeah. They kind of hide in trees in an area. If there's a nest of them, there there can be up to half a dozen of them. They target sleeping people by emitting this sort of buzz or hum that induces yeah. nightmares in the victim. They vibrate their body. Yeah, and if the person wakes up, the hum just kind of like, oh no, everything's okay, go back to sleep. And just basically drive people mad with the Infinity. discomfort and the nightmares <laughs> and various other things that are going on. Also, because they frequently attack and target sleeping individuals, it is easy for them, it is possible that they will drop down out of the tree, wrap the victim up in their silk cocoon webbing stuff, and haul them up into the tree, and then suck their guts out from inside <laughs> as well. They're not physically challenging, like relatively speaking, they're only a, you know, they're kind of geared as a, as a third circle challenge. Yeah. But they do have their entangling ability. They can spit their silk in order to start wrapping somebody up. It is poisonous. The silk has a, a paralytic poison as part of it so that it makes the victim potentially easier to wrap up. They're kind of creepy, nightmare-inducing, blood-sucking, organ-liquefying worm yeah. horrors. Yeah, they, they remind me of the movie Lair of the White Worm or the uh. movie Tremors. Yeah, I don't I wouldn't put them quite similar to the to the graboids from Tremors. Well, not as big, but not as big and and a, and a different kind of thing. These are these are yeah. more of a um stealthy ambush causing unsettling situations kind of construct. Oh yeah. Rather than one that is a more of a of a physical challenge. Yeah. This is a slow moving globular terror. <laughs> yeah. This is the sort of thing where a group comes upon a village or something that is having a problem with these and needs to track down the nest and root them out kind of thing. Agreed. Uh, so always fun. And uh, no, thank you. That doesn't sound like a good time for me as a player. So on to the sixth circle challenge, the Norikot. These are the large canines. We're talking four feet tall at the shoulder. They have boar tusks, uh, daredevil like troll horns, and so they're kind of referred to offhandedly as troll dogs, but any smart troll or any smart name giver will have nothing to do with them whatsoever because the Norikot requires name giver flesh in its diet. So these are going to eat you. Yeah. And they're going to enjoy it. <laughs> these guys, I would picture them as the devil dogs from Ghostbusters. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's what I would picture these things as. They're powerful, animalistic horror constructs that have enhanced senses. They've got a charge ability. They are suitable as animal companions, but not recommended. Not in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> it would be interesting to see, like, a kind of parody of a, of a cavalryman as a cadaverman or anything like that, using Norikots as mounts. Oh, yeah. 
or something weird like that. Um, we haven't really talked about the uh, unnatural life power that horrors have, or at least we haven't talked about it in a while. Fair. Unnatural life is a little bit different from the animate dead that creates cadaver men. Unnatural life kind of leaves the victim as they otherwise would be. Mm -hmm. It just ties their continued existence to the horror. <laughs> and so having a cavalryman that is subject perhaps to unnatural life, have a Noricot as their mount would be interesting. They've got enhanced senses that allows them to s detect targets and track things. Astral sight, they can uh, pounce and grab opponents. And if they knock them down, they get additional attacks on them. Brutal. They're just physically brutal animal <laughs> monsters. I, I saw you struggling for a word. And that was the only thing that came to mind is they're just brutal. And yeah, I, I don't want to see anybody try and actually have these as an animal companion as a beast master. Cause that's just uh, to, you're to asking for phrase, something barking up the wrong tree. You can do better and you should try. <laughs> so just saying, uh, but yeah, troll dogs as a nickname. So, uh, fun little wrinkle to, Fun little detail to work into your campaign there. Up next, this one's going to be a lot of fun for Josh to talk about as well. This is a shadow. It is a captured name giver spirit that acts as a spy. So basically it does reconnaissance for the horror itself. They, the shadows have some powers where they can possess victims by shaping themselves to match the victim's shadows. And they can control a victim's body, but not their mind. And they have a plethora of powers. Yeah, these guys with. are rough. <laughs> Between their their stealthy stride, their ability to shift to a two dimensional state where it is very difficult to attack them, um, it's even nastier than the normal insubstantial because it requires yeah. two additional successes to successfully hit them unless it's an oh. area attack. They gain bonuses against targets that are engulfed in darkness, and they can like expand and control shadows within a certain area as well. Yeah. They also have the ability to cast the Nethermancer spell Ethereal, Ethereal darkness. darkness. Yeah. So there's that too. But then there's the possession ability, which is just the nasty bit of things. They don't possess the mind, but they are able to control the body, which is something that is going to cause quite a bit of consternation in the victim, I would imagine, mm -hmm. because they are still conscious and aware, but unable to control what they are doing. There are some guidelines that are in place about uh, how to remove a shadow that has possessed someone and things like that and, and how things interact there. But yeah, the, the shadow is... Not a physical challenge in the way that a lot of these other constructs are. They are a spy. They're an intelligence gathering. They go in and they can cause chaos and sow distrust and cause problems as a result of what they can get people to do um, and are very, very difficult to deal with as a result of the abilities that they have. Yeah. These are also incredibly hard to spot before they take somebody over. Because again, they look like a shadow. They can control shadows. And they're very good at mimicking the shape of the shadow they're trying to inhabit the person of, if that's a sentence. And the only way you can really notice them is with, I think, a higher perception role, where you have to notice the glowing red eyes in the black field. So good luck with that. <laughs> so nice little wrinkle to throw in there as well. Onto the Skull Fiend, which is just a beautiful, beautiful name. These guys are fun. <laughs> yeah, these are nine foot wide piles of skulls that continuously scream death cries. I don't know what Morgan was smoking when he created this one, but uh, nicely done. Nothing. Nice he's just... Dude. No, he yeah. doesn't need to, he's just wonderful. In addition, yeah. it's also got tentacles, bony I, and tentacles. I say that with scare quotes, bony yes. tentacles that are made up of the <laughs> assembled vertebrae of the various Victims. skeletons that have been brought together to create this thing. Yep. And then the tentacles have these kind of like bony hands, or maybe there's a skull on the end of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. That just... All still screaming. All still screaming. <laughs> 
and it can sort of move by lifting itself up on these tentacles and kind of shifting around in that way. It is a creepy, disturbing, wonderful bit of so horror basically, that imagine Morgan came up with on this. If you've seen the movie The Incredibles with the big giant metal ball robot at the end with the four tentacles it's got, just ch- just change no, that. No, that's no, 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 no. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying for how it, I works. don't think that's appropriate. Fair enough. It's got a reach of 15 yards with its bone tentacles. Yeah. It can detach skulls from the base and they fly around trying to bite people. Um, mm-hmm. It's an area of attack. It attacks everybody within 10 yards. It's got like unending biting attacks, doesn't it? It's got this special fear ability called terrorizing scream that has the potential of basically invoking harried on everybody who is affected by it for the round. Like it's determined at the beginning of the round, it's immune to fear. It's got high resist pain. (laughs) It's got battle shout, you know, to impose even more penalties on people. Of course it can successfully, it's possible on a good attack test with its tentacles that it can pick up and throw people. As one of the special maneuvers is called, it's just unnerving. (laughs) It can grapple. It can pin victims down with its flying skulls. It's just, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird creature. It is a wonderful monster. It is this sort of bizarre, like, take on things. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It's 11th circle, so it's not to be trifled with. And if you see it, run. (laughs) <laughs> the opposite direction. Just going to say that now. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait to throw one at my, at my group when they get to the, you know, near 11th circle challenge rating onto the spectral child. Now we've talked oh. about the spectral dancer. The spectral yes. child is a slight offshoot where it's, it's undead. It counts as undead, but this is the spirit severed from the body and it's stuck in astral space. And look, I will put this very simply. The spectral child is a spectral dancer with two notable differences. One, it's a child. Well, there's that. (laughs) So that that's one. And two, you still kind of have to defeat it the same way. But rather than like the social dancing with it kind of thing, this one, you need to comfort it and assuage the child's sorrow. Yeah. This is a spectral dancer with the creepy child aspect thrown into it. Yeah. It's the same basic idea. It's mm-hmm. just creepy child looking for comfort as opposed to a powerful, highly charismatic individual trying to make a connection. Yeah. We talked about where there was the Dilkava. We mm-hmm. talked about the Pestilent Ghoul, which are like examples of different takes on classic yeah creatures that's what this is this is another case of we've taken the spectral dancer and made it creepy and terrifying in a different way fair the powers and maneuvers are they vastly different from the spectral dancer or are i don't know that's i i just that similar. question just occurred to me <laughs> i am flipping over to the gm's guide I to find Josh's the spectral mind. dancer to to take a look spectral dancer So the spectral child is tougher than the spectral dancer. The spectral dancer is sort of geared out as a fourth circle challenge. The spectral child is a sixth circle challenge. So it's got higher ratings in some cases. So it is a little bit more difficult in terms of of being uh, opposition or a challenge for a group. But it is more or less the same basic idea. Fair enough. No worries. Had to ask. On to, I think, one of the better named horror constructs, the Umbral Stalker. This is otherwise known as the soul hunter. This is a corrupted beast spirit. And if that's not enough to to keep you up at night, I'm not sure what is. Yeah. Well, the skull fiend, but yeah. We had example of the corrupted air spirit with the storm wraith, the corrupted fire spirit with the fire wraith, which we talked about recently. The umbral stalker is a corrupted beast spirit. So it is another spirit that has been corrupted and affected by horrors. Quite frequently, it is canine or feline in nature. What immediately comes to mind are the like the Hounds of Tindalos from um, the sort of Cthulhu mythos, which are extra dimensional 
hounds that mm-hmm. come through angles in things. Yeah. And will pursue someone to to death. That's kind of what goes on here with the Umbral Stalker. It chooses a victim and hunts them and tracks them down, sometimes over great distances. And it's got powers that allow it to do just that. It's got Mystic Pursuit. It's got awareness. It's got an ability called Soul Mark, which is sort of the the equivalent of how they can successfully track their prey over great mm-hmm. distances. It's sort of a, like a, a variant horror mark type of thing. If they successfully mark you, then they are always successful on Mystic Pursuit and tracking tests against their quarry. And it lasts until the next sunrise. You know, if you can keep away from them, then that might lapse and you might be able to get away from them that way. Maybe. <laughs> so you've got that, like the Hounds of Tindalos, the wild hunt, if you want to take like sort of a, a classic bit of folklore. Oh, yeah. The idea that if you end up being chosen as the quarry of the wild hunt, that you kind of need to uh, escape them or survive them for enough time for that to happen. So there's that. You know, they get bonuses as well to attack individuals that are marked. A stealthy stride, they can manifest and like jump out and do damage. Again, you are being pursued by a ghostly beast Animal. spirit. Yeah. Not creepy at all. No. No, not a bit. Not a bit. Two to go. We have the eighth circle challenge rating, the Wind Hag. This is the ethereal. She always appears as an ethereal elf woman in cold and windy places. So usually like mountaintops, which tells you so some horrors don't mind lurking in the mountaintops either, by the way. But the special thing about the Wind Hag is they hate living, beating hearts. So if you are, I don't know, alive and are near one of these, they'll come for you. Yeah, this is another sort of corrupted spirit, although in this case, it is the soul of a name giver that has been tortured and broken and then combined mystically with an air elemental. And so it can fly. It's another insubstantial one, so it's tougher to hit. It's got air attacks, but it also can is resistant to air and water. It's inhabits high mountain peaks and so forth and is just a really nasty thing that will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything on this list will, but yes. Just also a fun name, got to say. The wind hag. You don't often hear the word hag a lot. So, lastly and certainly not least is the wretched imp. This a horror construct resembles a small gargoyle, roughly about two feet tall. You know, I mean, do being carved gargoyles that like you found on uh, medieval castles and, and cathedrals and things. They do have leathery wings, but they only appear in the colors of brown, red, or black. So knock yourself out with some nice visuals on that one. These are, of course, created from children because yeah. the horrors know no more bounds. creepy children. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, another <laughs> nasty, creepy journeyman tier, twisted victim of a horror that, in this case, created as a result of betrayal of the child as a result of their guardian being deceived or influenced by a horror. In a yeah. similar way that the despair thought, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, will manipulate family members to do things. Mm -hmm. The wretched imps are not especially powerful physically, but they can fly and they've got powers that can make them kind of annoying to deal with. Being able to do ranged attacks, they've got a power that behaves a little bit like the Nethermancer spell Pain, where they can make their target believe that they are suffering wounds. They can blind their targets. They can netherwalk, which is scary, which means that they can sort of like disappear into astral space and reappear somewhere else. Yeah. Again, more creepy, (laughs) disturbing, (laughs) horrific imagery, which is what you want in these kinds of of things um, when you're dealing with, with a horror constructs and a horror game and the kind of nastiness that they can get up to. Yeah. It's the list we've hit so far of the 30 that we've done, 
yeah, all of these are things I don't want to meet in a dark alley anywhere. And that's for good reason. I wouldn't really want to meet any of them in a particularly well-lit alley either. <laughs> no, because some of these are really creepy looking and I, you know, let's go to Code Brown, change my pants and get out of, get out of Dodge. All there is to it. So yeah, folks, happy Halloween because it's coming up soon. Actually, I think like five or six days after this episode hits live air. So if you have any questions for us or if you've used some of these to great effect or... Uh, have an idea on how to use some of these to great effect or have a plot line you think a, a nice story would revolve around, uh, please drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. These are all really cool. I really enjoyed going through these and reminding myself of the weirdness and the creepiness and the unsettling potential of horror constructs. And we haven't even gotten into any of the true named horrors horrors yet (laughs) these are all just simply constructs and things that have come about as a result of horrors and depending on the relative power level of your game you know many of these could serve as a decent challenge in their own right in terms of the primary threat of a particular adventure or story or use it as a sign or indication of what is being done in an area. And you can use the type of horror construct to perhaps highlight the style of the horror in question that you might be dealing with in terms of a longer campaign arc type of opponent. Agreed. Something like Chantrell's horror, again, talking about things that we will be going into more depth later on. (laughs) would have a very different type of construct or minion that they would that it would create as opposed to a, a Kreskra or various types of bloat forms mm-hmm. or a crystal entity or something like that. Yeah. And so you can use the minions, you can use the constructs or take existing constructs and reflavor them or retheme them in order to highlight the mood and style and whatnot of the horror in question that you might be dealing with in terms of a larger campaign opponent. I mean, a horror that creates wretched, wretched imps. Imp. Yeah. You know, if perhaps you're you're dealing with a horror that might feed off of the pain of parents having betrayed their children or something. And so it would have wretched imps or spectral children Mm-hmm. as the sort of minions and lesser entities that you might encounter in the course of pursuing this thing to put a stop to it, stuff like that. You might have a a more powerful despair thought that once it has convinced its victim to commit suicide, that maybe those victims become spectral children. Mm-hmm. You can really use like theming and stuff like that to really play into what type of horror you might be dealing with. And that sort of thing could perhaps be used as information that the group might be able to turn to their advantage in some way. And don't forget when you're dealing with horror constructs, especially built on children, go over your consent in gaming. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Let's, let's not forget those. That could be something that is a, is a hard line for some people. Yeah. Understandably so and and rightfully so, you know, in the same way that like certain flavors of body horror and whatnot yeah. might be out of bounds for someone. And when you are dealing with things that are intended to cause discomfort and fear or revulsion or whatever within the audience, mm-hmm. you want to make sure that you are doing so in a safe manner. Yeah. That you have a safe space in a sense that people are free to have the emotions and the reactions that they are going to have without feeling ambushed or Mm -hmm. anything like that. And to know where the lines are, where the veils are, to what degree, and, and to have that open communication in place. Some people might find the skull fiend. Oh, yeah because it's just bones, might not find that particularly 
I mean, it's creepy and disturbing, but they might not have the same kind of visceral reaction to that yes. because it is also, in a, in a sense, a little bit silly yep. <laughs> because it's a, just a gigantic <laughs> animated pile of bones in a way. Mm-hmm. And that would be very different from, say, the boneless, for example. Yes. You know, which is just a big sort of protoplasmic mass of flesh, mm-hmm. which is a very different kind of thing. And so it, it, you could potentially take something like a, a boneless, like if that kind of raw, unskinned muscle and flesh is something that is sort of out of bounds for the group, you could reskin that as a more skeletal kind of thing, yeah. making it a lesser power skull fiend or something along those lines. So those are all things to keep in mind when you're dealing with stuff like this. And again, having a safe space for your group and and that is not meant in any kind of pejorative sense no as a horror game in a sense but earth dawn is also pretty heroic fantasy in its flavor and there can be a situation where depending on the type of mood that you are trying to deal with in the game are you really going for like a, a dark unsettling horror feel where you're going to have perhaps goosebumps or or skin crawl type feelings on you know on your players Mm -hmm. how much detail how much are you going to sort of delve into those aspects of fear and revulsion and body horror or other kinds of stuff or is it going to be a little bit more of a heroic yes this is just kind of some kind of nasty flesh beast thing but we're not going to dwell on the visuals It's the difference in a way between the original Sam Raimi Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, which are very similar movies from a storytelling, like from a pure plot point of view. But the presentation of them is very different. One is a true like horror movie Mm -hmm. in the traditional sense, whereas another is more comedy slapstick or whatever. Yeah. Or something like cabin in the woods it's a horror movie but it is also kind of self-aware and somewhat tongue-in-cheek because of the tropes that it is playing with look at the different george romero zombie movies you know dawn of the dead Dead. day of the dead night of the living dead yeah and then the Zack snyder then the Zack snyder remakes which are very different in flavor or zombie movies themselves like have a huge spread of tones you know you've got things like Shaun of the dead yeah or you know which is a zombie movie and it is a horror movie in a way but it is also army of darkness or cabin Mm -hmm. in the woods is a little bit more self-aware and tongue-in-cheek and has that humor that undercuts and in its own way lessens the horror aspect of it yeah whereas Mm -hmm. the original night of the living dead is even like The zombies in that are more of just kind of like an environmental thing. And the real challenge is the conflict of personalities of the people who are trapped in the house. Yep. Right. The George Romero Dawn of the Dead is very different from Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. Oh, completely. Because they are very different stylistically, even though superficially they are kind of telling the same story set in a very similar place. But they are made in different times and have different... Levels of special and, effects. And, and styles and stuff. It's not just even the level of special effects. It's just yeah. that the way that the story is being told, the way that the film is being presented and made, there is a huge variety of things that you can do as a result of that. And there's a lot that you can do with mood and tone, even without getting into necessarily a lot of jump scares or physical descriptions of stuff like that the original blair witch project doesn't have a whole lot of real special effects going for it no that's all suspense there's very little in terms of like you know monster shots or or anything along those lines i'll be honest i am not a huge fan of that movie Mm -hmm. i think it has a couple of really effective moments but i think overall it i'm not personally crazy about it fair but it does show kind of what you can do even with minimal visualization of mm-hmm. what's going on there. That you don't necessarily need to have high-end special effects and weird monster stuff in order to have an effective 
psychological situation. Agreed. From a horror movie type standpoint. Yeah, it's it's a different style of storytelling. That's all it is. Uh, some do suspense and some do splatter up against a wall that you can actually see. Take your pick. Go over there. As Josh said, just make sure you're in a safe space dealing with horrors and horror constructs. Uh, cause we had that whole safety episode a little while ago. So just reminding yep. everybody since we've done three episodes now of horror constructs, brush up on those, uh, uh, commitments just a little bit just to be safe. So until next time, folks, uh, try getting some good sleep with these in mind for your legend. Good night, everybody. Good night.